Now, friends, we pray for the church, for the world, and the church's place in the world, and it is a responsive prayer. So when you hear me say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in his name. Confident in your love and mercy, we offer our prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide so that united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the rulers of the nations. Move them to set aside their fear, greed, and vain ambition, and bow to your sovereign rule. Inspire them to strive for peace and justice, that all your children may dwell secure, free of war and injustice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us who consume most of the world's resources the will to reorder our lives, that all may have their rightful share of food, medical care, and shelter, and so have the necessities of a life of dignity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Restore among us a love of the earth that you created for our home. Help us put an end to ravishing its land, air, and waters, and give us respect for all your creatures, that living in harmony with everything you have made, our whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise to your glorious name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress, free us from crime and violence. Guard our youth from the per perils of drugs and materialism. Give all citizens a new vision of a life of harmony. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and sacraments that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those with incurable and stigmatized diseases, those unjustly imprisoned, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned as you have moved toward us in love, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, friends, each week I have a little lesson that I will teach to the congregation, and I usually have some folks help me in that. It could be something related to the sermon, something that's just a good piece of Christian theology we all should know, or something about the day on the church calendar. But if you'd like to help me out in teaching this lesson today, I invite you to meet me down front in front of the communion table. <coughs> Good morning, good morning, good morning. How y'all doing today? Good, good. So um, I, I, got a, I got a question uh, for y'all. Uh, what's this? What is this? <laughs> you don't know? Really? Well, great. It's time for a lesson, and y'all better pay attention because it's important. Come here, come here. This is the table of Jesus Christ. We call it the Lord's Table, we call it Communion. It is a symbol of the love of Jesus Christ and the symbol of our identity in Jesus Christ. 
See, on the night that our Lord was betrayed, you know, he, he had a guy, a friend named, uh, named Judas who betrayed him and had him arrested. But before that, he sat down to dinner with his disciples and he took a piece of bread as they began to eat and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, he wasn't saying this was like literally my body, but this is a symbol of I'm making a sacrifice for you. I'm, I'm sacrificing myself, my own body, my own life for the sake of you all. And then after they had eaten, he took, took, it, took the cup and he poured it out and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's being sealed in my blood. So he was talking about the sacrifice that he was about to make for all of us. And, and we, we continue this tradition on to this day. It's a sign of God's grace for us that we, we take some bread and we take some juice. We do grape juice. Some churches use wine, but we don't like to drink this early on a Sunday morning. So we just go with the, with the good stuff, the non-alcoholic stuff. We take a piece of bread and a little bit of the juice. And it, one, reminds us of the sacrifice of Jesus, reminds us of the love of Jesus. But it also signifies that we come together at this table with everyone who ever believes in Jesus and whoever will believe in Jesus. This is a symbol of our identity as, as people, as followers of Jesus Christ. And we believe through the power of the Holy Spirit that whenever we come to this table, we are joining in this feast with, with all believers of every time and place. And that's a really cool thing because it goes across any dividing lines we make for ourselves, right? Or any, any, any dividing lines of time, right? So we come to this table with someone from, from, from 2,000 years ago and for thousands of years in the future. People from, from uh, Africa and South America and Europe and Asia and Australia and even people who celebrate communion on the South Pole. People who are, who are poor or very rich. The, the ones who are well beloved in their lives and those who are ignored. We all come together in God's love. This is kind of the defining characteristic of our life, this communion that we have in Jesus Christ. So when we come to this table here in a few minutes, remember that we come together as a family that is far bigger than we could ever conceive of. At this table, Christ claims us as his own. Truly a beautiful thing. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us all, always to remember that we are yours, that you bring us together in love, and that we should let nothing separate us from one another as you have brought us together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thanks for coming up and helping, ladies. Y'all can have a seat. You're welcome. <laughs> now, as we prepare for the word of God read and proclaimed, let us together sing our prayer for illumination. The scripture today is the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the peace of bond. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what it does mean, but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Here in the word. Thank you. Now, friends, as we get into the message today, I invite you to grab something to take some notes with. There should be a pad of paper in the pew rack in front of you. Grab the notes app on your phone. Anything to write something down that jumps out to you in this message today to take into the week ahead, because I'm confident that God is going to speak to you at some point in this message today. Now, friends, how we see people greatly determines what we think about them and how we treat them. And it also affects how we see the world. Perhaps the most common way that we see people is by reducing them down to what groups they can fit into. And since we've, and once we've done that, we then kind of let that group classification define who that individual is to us. Someone might look at a person with gray hair and identify them as old. And then their mind defines them with a bunch of old people stereotypes. Like, they probably drive slow, probably don't know how to use technology, and they probably get confused by anything that was invented in the last 20 years. Again, I said stereotypes, not ironclad defining characteristics of the age group. Another person might look at someone in their 20s, classify them as a young person, and then define them with young people stereotypes. They probably have no work ethic. They're constantly on their smartphones. And we probably wouldn't actually be able to communicate because they likely speak some weird language that I don't understand. In fact, OK, that was honestly one of the first things that I realized that I truly was not like a young person anymore because like I heard the current slang and I had no clue what was being said. But we classify people based on all sorts of demographics, right? Age, race, gender, education level, where they're from, what they do for a living, what their hobbies are, religious beliefs, what they drive, on and on and on on. We look at people only long enough to fit them into a category or two, and then we think we know everything about them, just because we know the stereotype of that group, or because maybe we've had a few experiences with people within that group. The weird thing really to me happens uh, when some people will lean into that group identity and intentionally try and take the, the group identity they want to belong to 
and then make that their whole individual identity. For example, there for a while when I was younger, um, I really tried to make being a hunter like my whole personality. I was wearing my branded outdoor clothing to high school, right? And more so than just like, okay, it's branded like hunting equipment. No, it was Mossy Oak camouflage branded equipment because you had to be Team Mossy Oak, at least in my mind. Real tree, that's trash. No, Mossy Oak, that's where it's at. That's how I thought. I, if I, I, I watched almost nothing but the outdoor channel, hunting and fishing shows. If I could have afforded it, I would have bought a, a, a big pickup truck and covered it with camouflage wrap. <laughs> and I told anybody who would listen that I was a hunter. And I honestly tried to alter my personality to what I thought a hunter would act like. Looking back, I realized that I was someone who felt disconnected. And I was looking for any kind of community to identify with. And since I like the outdoors anyway, I went whole hog into this outdoorsman identity. The sad thing about both looking at someone and seeing only a group identity and conversely taking our group identity and making it our whole identity is that in both cases the result is that the individual gets seen less and less. They become small and unseen. And when that occurs, it is a recipe for a cascade of negative emotion and further estrangement from others and from the world at large. Right now, possibly the most prevalent case of seeing group identity in this country is with regard to politics. It may have always been this way, but you know, to some extent or another, but within the last 10 years, painting with a broad brush has gotten so much more common and a trap that we fall into way too easy. People on all points of the political spectrum increasingly so see those who have chosen a different political side to be awful. Trump voters and people on the left increasingly see each other as just plain horrible people. They reduce every single person down to this one aspect of their life and judge it to be horrible. And those who have actually made supporting this or that side into their whole personality have greatly impoverished their own lives and set aside their own identity and replaced it with simply being a foot soldier of a political movement. This tribalism and the resulting diminishing of people of a different tribe is so toxic to our society and it is the very definition of stupidity and the world cannot long endure more of it. Christians are supposed to have the antidote to this. The author of Ephesians tells us what to do. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Dealing with another person humbly, gently, with patience, with love, demands seeing that person as an individual and not just as part of a group. Not seeing them as the group identity. Holding a particular position on a set of issues does not encompass the whole of a person. Humans are far more complicated and complex and wonderful than that. One of my favorite things to come out of the dumpster fire that was the 2016 election was a video that a group made where they went to the to parking lots outside of a, a Trump rally and a parking lot outside of a Hillary rally. They showed maybe 30 seconds of interviews with individuals that were waiting in either line. 
And people at either event said horrible things about the opposing candidate. And they would even say some really nasty stuff about people who would support the other candidate. And then it cut to a shot of people just waiting in line, right? The camera is, is way far off from the line, and there are people waiting to get in. Line's not moving. It was well before the event was to start. And then as the camera focused on these people, a, a golden retriever ran into frame and ran up to the person at the center of the, of the, of the shot. And of course, the person would start petting the dog and greeting the dog, oh, hey there. And, you know, and, and the dog had a collar on and a leash, and so they you know, discern, okay, this is someone's dog that just got away from them. Okay, so they start petting the dog and looking around, and you know, the, the, the very friendly dog. They picked the best dog for this, uh, for this particular stunt. And so they pet the dog for a little bit, and then its owner would, would come up to the dog and say, oh, thank you so much for finding my dog. They just got, a, got away from me. And... Uh, and, but then the, the, the owner, when they showed up, was wearing a T-shirt for the opposite candidate. So if they were at a Trump rally, the owner walked up wearing a Hillary T-shirt. If they were at a Hillary rally, the owner walked up wearing a Trump shirt. And in, in both cases, eventually, the people in the line realized the shirt that the owner was wearing and, and asked about it. So oh, you're, you're voting for them? And I say, oh, yeah, yeah, I really, I really like the policies. But they kept paying attention to the dog, and a really cool thing happened. They'd make mention of the opposing political party, but then they just went back to dogs, talking about dogs. Did you have a dog growing up? Oh, yeah, I did, and I got two at home right now. And they talked about, and the conversation evolved into everything, talking about growing up, talking about what you're doing for a living now. You know, regular human stuff. When we take time to actually see a person, most of the time they become pretty hard to hate. Now it's not a guarantee they're going to be a good person. I think we all know that there are plenty of jerks out there in every single demographic and every single political group. But we each owe it to every single person we meet to be curious about who they are and let them show us who they are, rather than just assuming that we know everything about them because we can identify one or two groups they belong to. And we need to drop our labels, particularly our political labels, and be vulnerable enough with them to show them who we are so that we can see each other. We're, we're more complex and more interesting than just someone who can spout off a bunch of partisan talking points. I can't tell you how many people I've personally known who have lost friends and family members over politics since 2015. I even have a colleague whose marriage ended because one spouse was so fanatical in the support of their candidate. It's gone on far too long. And Christians, people who have a command from God to maintain the bonds of peace, are, have been as guilty as any in this division, in causing and perpetuating and continuing this division. The calling that you have been called to is not making an identity out of supporting a political candidate or a political party. That is far beneath you. The calling to which you have been called is to recognize the sovereignty of God over your life. And you are to follow God and not a politician. Your identity is in Christ, not in politics. Your Savior is Jesus Christ who gave everything for all of us, who came in the name of love, who seeks to reconcile humans to each other and to God, who works so that we can know others and be completely known by them. This is who we are supposed to be making our identity after, the true Savior who desires only love, 
not politicians who will do and say anything for the sake of their own power. I say this as a person who spent years of his life arguing politics on the internet and who dreamed of a career in politics. If your chief concern is politics and you live and die with the fortunes of your political side, that is idolatry. And not only that, you are wasting your life. You owe God so much more. You owe yourself so much more. You are so much more than that. Do not reduce yourself to something so small and so pathetic. And don't you dare reduce somebody else to something so small and so pathetic as politics. Look, politics is important, there is no doubt about that, but don't be fooled. The major parties don't care at all if you ruin every relationship in your life in support of them. The goal of a political party is to gain and retain power for themselves. And the easiest way to do that is to get ordinary people to tear each other apart. The best way to counteract their efforts is to care about others, to have empathy for others. To look at other people and see yourself in them, to know that they are loved by God just as much as you are. Stop defining others by their politics. Stop defining yourself by your politics. You are someone of far greater depth and worth than the current political landscape. And so is everybody else. Let us pray. Gracious God, let us see the glory and the beauty and the wonder present in each human life. Help us to look upon one another not as a potential adversary, a potential threat, but let us see everyone we meet as someone who is beloved by you someone who is unimaginably complex, one who has a full life, and one who, just like ourselves, seeks connection. Help us, O oh Lord, to connect with one another. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let us affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed, the creed of the whole church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please be seated? Friends, having been confronted with the grace of God, we respond in gratitude by offering God all that we are in service of God. We offer our prayers, our kind words to each other, our helpful actions here in the world, and our possessions, both as a sign of trust in Christ to provide and a tool to help in that ministry. If you'd like to give monetarily to the mission of God through Park Church, we have place for that purpose in the Narthex and in Perk Place. You may also give online at our website, parkpresby.org. But friends, now in a time of song and prayer, let us rededicate ourselves to God this day. Let us pray. We offer all of this grateful for your covenant, that in all things you are working your purposes out within our sight and well beyond. Amen. Would you please be seated? Friends, now we come to the joyful feast of the people of God, this feast that transcends all borders, both geographic, time, and those borders that we have invented ourselves that keep us separate from one another. This is the feast of Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us they will come from east and west, from north and from south, and sit at table together in the kingdom of God. Friends, this is the table of the resurrection, resurrected Savior. And when the resurrected Jesus sat with his disciples and took bread and broke it, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. May we recognize him now at this table today. This is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not the table of Park Presbyterian Church, not the table of the Presbyterian Church USA. This is the table of our Lord and our risen Lord invites all who seek to follow him to come and to be fed. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and delight, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O holy Lord, eternal God. You created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. You made us in your own image, and in countless ways you show us your mercy. Therefore, with the choirs of angels and the whole company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name joining our voices in their unending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory and blessing are yours, O holy God, for in your mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, he took our human nature and suffered death on the cross for our redemption. There he made a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. We praise you that before he suffered and died, our Savior gave us this holy sacrament and commanded us to continue it until he comes again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Merciful God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and cup, that in eating and drinking we may be made one with Christ and with one another. And as we come to the table that he prepared, we pray the prayer that he taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us 
us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner after they had eaten, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. Friends, as you come to receive the elements, we ask you to come forward by the two center aisles. You will meet me in the center, and I'll give you a piece of bread. Go to my right or to my left, and, they will, and you will receive a small cup of juice. You can consume the elements here and throw the cups away at the uh, waste paper baskets on either side as you return to your seats via the side aisles, or you can take the elements to your seat and consume them there. But friends, let us come to the table of Jesus Christ, for all has been prepared. One for you. One for you. Body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. 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 The body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ. Thank you. Body of Christ broken for 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 you and for her. Body of Christ broken for you. 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 The blood of Christ shed for you. Good take one. Body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us, Send us out 
to be the body of Christ in the world. Amen. Friends, go out into this great, big, complicated, beautiful, wonderful, captivating world and go out knowing that nothing separates you from one another but your own curiosity and your own love and your own willingness to be vulnerable with the people we share this world with. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and give you grace. Grace not to sell yourself short but grace to risk something big for something good. Grace enough to know the world is now too small for anything but the truth and too terrified for anything but love. May God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. God take your hands and work through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>